What is a Protestant? A Protestant is someone who, who used to, not anymore, this is all taken over by high-level Shriner Freemasonry. I don't know of a Protestant church I'd want to go to. But a Protestant used to be someone who protested the papal power and who believed the Bible to be the final authority of faith and practice. Speaking down in, in Texas, in South Texas, where uh, in a large church, uh, the Masons uh, who were in the church, uh, many of them on the altar board, uh, saw my tape Sunday morning when I was speaking there, and they said, you know, why are we allowing this man into our church? Uh, uh, he's criticizing Freemasonry. And most of the elder board were Masons. The Sunday school teachers were Masons. In fact, one of the elders was the worshipful master of the lodge in town. Another one was the supreme potentate of the shrine. And they came to me after the service, and I said, well, you have the books. I said, look up in your own books, in context, what I say. I gave the chapters, of the page numbers. They spent till four in the morning, Sunday night, going through all the documentation in their own Masonic library. They came back Monday and they said, we want you to know, Ron, we all resigned from the lodge last night. And we are seeing this happen all across the country as Masons will peel away the outer wrapping of the package and examine the content of what they're in. They will discover that they are in a non-Christian, pagan, idolatrous, cult and no Christian has any part in it. In order to get into that though there was something very important I had to do. I had to become a Freemason because you can't get involved in Satanism on the hardcore level without first being a Freemason. And so I found someone I was sponsored in the Masons and I became a first, second, third degree Mason. Uh, I went through the York Rite. I went through the Shrine. In fact this is my uh, my little Shrine portrait here. As you can see by this time I'd kind of shed some of my hippie appearance. Uh, I just shudder every time I see that thing. Um, but this is just kind of by way of documentation that I, I really was involved in these things. That was my official shrine portrait, which they took as part of my initiation. Hello and welcome everybody to another reading of The Great Exodus or The Time of the End. How near are we to it by James Aiken Wiley on this Saturday, September 7th. 2019. Yes, indeed, a Sabbath day. And I'm joined here with Michael and Yerk in uh, both Germany and Belgium in Europe, where it's afternoon there and it's morning here. And I'm really looking forward to getting back into the reading with and discussion with both of you. So let's uh, welcome Michael to the mic. Welcome, Michael. Good morning, Brett. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the Brad Norman Broadcast Channel for another reading. And so I'm looking forward to it. Actually, I'm looking forward to have a little bit of rest because I just got in from five miles jogging and I feel myself a little bit ugh. But nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, I Great. think that's that's the right. And I'm in the right shape and the right mood. I'm focused on the things that are coming because the body is now tired, but the the spirit wow. is well awakened. Michael, five miles? How many kilometers is that? About eight kilometers. Wow, that's a good exercise. Yeah. Really good. So, Yerk, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, yeah thanks. I'm, uh, I'm already tired of listening to running five miles, let, <laughs> let alone, let, let alone I, could, I, I couldn't even run half a mile and I would be oh. more exhausted than Michael already is, you know. I'm I'm growing fat and lazy. <laughs> uh -oh. I can't I can't help it. But you know, um, that's the way the cookie crumbles. As yeah, the way the cookie crumbles. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you're okay. So I'm I'm okay. glad that we are back on this book reading, The Great Exodus by James Edkin Wiley. Um, I, I don't know how long it's been. Half a year, three quarters of a year. It's been a long time. We are in the. It's 16th. been a long time. Yeah. Yeah, we are in the 16th reading today. Starting chapter 11, if I'm not mistaken, on page 161 in the PDF that you uh, that you made, and um, mm. I didn't have time to prepare. Of course, as always, I just read the last, I think, four or five pages in advance, just to get a little bit back into the spirit. But now we are starting with a new chapter. So, what is that good for? I don't know. Anyway, um, this book is from James Edkin Wiley, 
And I think that we established this book has been written or published about the time of 1862, something like that, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. And um, I'm just reading in German the book of uh, the papacy is the Antichrist, not the short one, a demonstration, but the big one, 450 pages from James Edkin Wiley. I'm reading that in German every, um, every second mm -hmm. Sunday night, so uh, for tomorrow, uh, that is on the schedule, I think, again. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know, because I also read Babylon Mystery Religion and, uh, you know, changing from one week to another, the book that I'm reading there for an hour. But so I'm glad that I go back to this James Atkin Wiley book again, and I think we have sorted all the quote-unquote problems we had with this book out, because we are reading the whole book of Acts to establish that the time then when the 70th week of Daniel, uh, speaking of Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, when that ended, so that means verse 27, when uh, he brought the sacrifices and oblations to cease, that was the end of the 70th week of Jesus Christ in the flesh, when he went to the cross, and that three and a half years later, the um, gospel went to the Gentiles, and we established that that surely could not have been the time of the stoning of Stephen. Because at the time of the stoning of Stephen, just to refresh a little bit our, our minds, and especially our readers and viewers' minds, we have to understand that at the time of the stoning of Stephen, Saul, who we later call Paul the Apostle, uh, still was Saul. Yeah? He still was uh, a persecuting power for, uh, for the Jews. And... Um, he didn't bring the gospel to the Gentiles right after the stoning. It took him a few years to do that. And we established that through the reading of uh, the book of Acts. I don't even remember by heart right now where it was anymore. Just if you want to know, well, <laughs> uh, uh -huh. go, to, go to the channel and watch the playlist, The Great Exodus. There are all readings of the book of Acts that we did in there, and then you will find out. You will find out even a little bit more interesting stuff as we did our studies there, because Michael said that he was in need of a better understanding, and I hope that we gave him that better understanding by studying the whole book of Acts. And after that, we were taking a detour to the book of um, Albert Close. The Divine Program of the World's History. And we finished that book from the first to the last part in 62 readings. And after that, we promised we return to continue in the Great Exodus. So, without any further ado, this today is the next 16th reading of the Great Exodus of James Edkin Wiley. And I'm just sipping my coffee here in the meantime, because my spirit is not awake as um, Michael's is, because I haven't been running five miles. Um... We are just taking the book on page 161, as you can see in chapter 11, Harmony of Prophetic Cycles. This is where we're going to continue reading today. On what principle are these periods arranged? Yeah, we are speaking about the periods in the previous chapter, about um, time, times a half a time, 1,203 score days, three and a half years, 42 months. Yeah? On what principle are these periods arranged? Are their lengths the result of an arbitrary decree? Or do they expand in a regulated series, the one developing from the other, according to a certain law of progression? Are they independent, the one of the other? Or do they bear a hidden relation, so that the first and lowest become the, uh, the precursors and types of the last and highest, and find in them their completed development? Michael, may I ask you to mute your mic in the meantime, please? Are these various epochs seen to embody, when closely examined, a grand inner harmony? This is a question of great interest, but it is one of whose difficulty is quite equal to its interest. The principle that regulates the length of these periods we have already so far enunciated. The number seven serves as a basis for them all. The primeval, the primeval appointment of the Sabbath is the scale, as it were, according to which all the other divisions of time which God had ordained have been laid down. This we can especially trace in the great festivals of the Jews. All the divisions of their sacred time proceeded by sevens. Seven revolutions of the day brought around the Sabbath. 
Seven revolutions of the year brought round the sabbatic year. Seven revolutions of the sabbatic year brought around the great era of Jubilee. Let it be marked that the root of each of these is, quote, seven times, unquote. Seven times gave a Sabbath, the time here being a day. Seven times gave a sabbatic year, the time here being a year. And seven times gave a jubilee, the time here being a sabbatic year. Let us mark farther the change of character which passed upon these several periods as soon as they had fulfilled themselves and ushered in each the sacred era to which it looked forward. During their currency all of them were so far eras of bondage. Servile work might be done in them, debts might be contracted, liberty might be forfeited, the Israelite uh, the Israelite might pledge his lands or his person during them, but each of these eras ended in a period of rest and release. Such emphat emphatically was the Sabbath. It was a day of holy rest, and to my understanding it still is a day of holy rest. No, Amen to that. <laughs> yeah, no servile work was to be done upon it. For that day the distinction of master and servant was unknown, so far as regarded the obligation to labor. Um, <laughs> I, I can't help to uh, make a little comment here on, on this Sabbath thing. It says, it was a day of holy rest, no servile work was to be done upon it. Now, shouldn't we determine what servile work is? Isn't servile sure. work when you just go and earn your money? Does servile work anything have to do with going to the kitchen and prepare lunch or dinner? In you guys' Probably understanding? No. Yeah, no, I think servile is being a servant to someone else. Right. So, for example, when I go shopping on a Saturday or on a Sabbath, then I oblige somebody else to do servile work because I go to a shop and I want to buy something and therefore he needs to serve me, right? Yep, that's so true. So that is not good. I it's don't do good. any servile work to earn any money on a Sabbath either. But I don't do any servile work when I stand in the kitchen and when I prepare a fresh lunch or a fresh dinner, when I just make something to eat for myself. I don't even do servile work when I mow my own lawn or garden or trim my own garden on that Saturday or Sabbath day because it is just for my pleasure. It's still a rest. Work, quote-unquote work, can be rest. I think we have to make a little bit of distinction between the Sabbath laws of the Jews and I explicitly now say the Jews and not the Israelites because they were masters in turning the Sabbath into a burden instead of a relief. And Jesus said even so. Jesus with his disciples went through a cornfield. They picked corn because there were a hunger on the Sabbath day. And the Jews came up to them and said, Oh, you are breaking the Sabbath laws. Well, because of the Sabbath I have to starve? I mean, I'm, I'm not allowed to eat. I'm not allowed to pick corn. Where is that servile work? Well, it would be servile work if I picked the corn and gave it to a quote-unquote master and he keeps it, and may, keeps it and maybe makes bread of it or and sells it. That would be servile work. But not if I pick the corn and eat it for myself. Just when I stroll along the street and I see a bush of raspberries or something like that and I pick a few raspberries and eat them <laughs> yeah. on, on the way. That's right. And that is no servile work. You know, there have been so many quote-unquote laws made by men, and especially the Jews in the time, especially, let's, let's not pick on the Jews alone. It was even during the time of the Israelites, when all twelve tribes were together. Probably the Levites were putting some laws of these on all of Israel uh, in that time. I don't know. I wasn't there at that time. I don't know who were all the quote-unquote scribes and Pharisees. But those people made the Sabbath a burden. 
That's why Jesus Christ said the Sabbath was made for man, not man was made for the Sabbath. Right? That's something we have to remember. So when the author here speaks of servile work, I agree, servile work we should not do, because God already says in the very first, um, I think it is the second chapter of Genesis, six days he worked, he created everything, and on the seventh day he rested. Therefore, in Exodus he says, six days shalt thou do all thy work and rest on the seventh day. Therefore, remember the Sabbath day. It's a day of rest. Rest. It doesn't even say that it is a day of worship. It is a day of rest. Rest from the yoke that is put upon us on this Antichrist system, for example. Don't do any work for that. But just do, for example, work for the Lord. Like we do with this reading here. Oh, am I not allowed to read this book and record it because the camera now is working? And record this because it is a Sabbath day? Hell yeah, I'm doing a lot job, right? With this, I'm not doing any servile work. I don't sell these videos, I put them out there for free. It's no servile work, but I am, in the meantime, a servant of the Lord. And I am a servant of the Lord seven days a week. 365 a year. <laughs> or 360 in a biblical year, whatever. I think this is a point a little bit needed to be clear out. I don't know about you guys. What do you think? Um, yeah, that's perfectly clear, Yerk. Perfectly clear. And I looked up the word in the old dictionary here, and it's basically, yeah, the same context we're talking about. It, it has to do such as pertains to a servant or slave, slavish, mean, such as proceeds from dependence. Held in subjection, dependent, cringing, fawning, meaning submissive. <clears throat> okay, we established right. that. That's done. Yeah, I think it's it's all work, uh, which is uh, which you are have you have to do as a duty. You see, <clears throat> and I think that's uh, what what we are doing here with the lectures and this all this is God's service, and it's not any kind of material service or any service for the world. Yeah, exactly. I was thinking about all the biblical references of the rest, you know, entering the rest, entering the day of the Lord, entering the rest of the Lord. You know, there's so many different biblical references we can look at and study. Uh, you know, it just it, it just blows my mind that, that uh, you know, I've never heard uh, any sermons on on uh, keeping the rest, keeping the Sabbath, keeping it holy? Uh, never in my entire life have I heard a, a preacher behind a pulpit speak of it. Only the the Bible teachers on the street that are out there trying to save us poor souls are the ones that'll maybe even talk about it to us if we approach them on the subject. But in terms of uh, the institutional learning, it's it's just been completely abolished. All the institutionalized church, of course. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Sunday is the day of uh, Sabbath now, according to Rome. Yeah, the, the day Roman of rest. System. The day yeah. of rest. Yeah. Yeah, I know. There's a video that I cannot show because of this blocked uh, copyright um, on uh, from the European Sunday Commission. Oh, yeah, gotcha. I got that Good on the computer, point. but I can't show that boy, because it boy. will be it will be blocked with copyright stuff anyway. Uh, so nobody is to know about that except they put it out. Anyway, isn't that interesting? How these how these uh, these rulers these uh, these overlords work they they push certain buttons in europe and then they push certain buttons in america and they keep the people confused they keep them down they keep them you know uh should we say stupid and servile, brett yeah they, they servile, servi yeah. servile yeah that's right so that they can serve yep the master they choose not the master we choose. I mean, I saw so the, the Antichrist. Yeah, the Antichrist likes to push his mark 
on us and say, swallow it up. It's biblical. Yeah. Never mind that he changed the Bible. Many and times. these people teach from corrupted Bibles. Shame. They do, but let's not go down that road because otherwise no. this will be a podcast <laughs> for the next 20 hours or something. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jürgen. I just, I just wanted to establish the point that we really have to think about the Sabbath question that is mentioned here by James Edgar Wiley. It says, such emphat emphatically was the Sabbath. It was a day, and it still is, a day of holy rest. No servile work was to be done. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh yeah, I can. I can give nice. this some color. <laughs> no servile work was to be done upon it. For that day, the distinction of master and servant was unknown so far as regarded the obligation to labor. The whole nation, the lowest individual equally with the highest, came that day into the enjoyment of a liberty the fullest, as it is the highest man can enjoy on earth. The nation on that day owned but one master, their sovereign Jehovah. I also have to say something about this little part of the sentence here. The lowest individual equally with the highest individual. In a real Christian world, my dear brothers and sisters, there is no low individual and high individual. We are all brothers and sisters on the same level. And Jesus Christ is our master. Right? Right. So when James Edgar Wiley speaks about the whole nation, the lowest individual equally with the highest, you are already not in accordance with the word of God. Because you have a nation of unequals. You have lower degrees and higher degrees. You have a hierarchy that is not of the Bible. So the point is, how can you pick and choose, you know? You pick a little bit of this and you pick a little bit of that and you make your own laws and you make your own nation the way, not the way God tells you to do it, but the way you want to do it. You pick a little bit of this and a little bit of that. You mix it all around and all of a sudden you say, hey, this is my nation. The whole nation, the lowest individual equally with the highest. This is for all of Europe. This is for all the world counting came that day into the enjoyment of a liberty at the fullest, as it is the highest man can enjoy on earth. The nation on that day owned but one master, the sovereign Jehovah. So when I only have one master, there cannot be a higher or a lower individual. This is an oxymoron. It's not biblical anyway. Mm -hmm. Similar immunities were enjoyed on the Sabbatic year. That, too, was a period of rest and liberty, and the rest and liberty under the security of a divine charter. Let us mark how complete and full was that rest, not only to every Israelite of whatever degree, but even to the stranger, to the cattle, and to the beast and the land. Quote, and the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years shalt thou sow thy field, and six years shalt, shalt prune, thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field, nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest thou shalt not reap, neither gather the grapes of thy vine undressed, for it is a year of rest unto the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you, and thee, and for thy servant, and for thy maid, and for thy hired servant, and for thy stranger that sojourneth with thee, and for thy cattle, and for the beasts that are in thy land, shall all the increase thereof be meat. 
unquote. Leviticus chapter 25 verses 1 through 7. When you go back to these old Testament books, you will see that God provides. When you are not allowed to grow anything on your field, the harvest on the year before will be at least double of what it is normally. And you can stock up so that you don't have to work on the seventh year. And when you then re-sow on the eighth year, you still have meat or plants, whatever, to eat from the sixth year. God will provide. It is not on you to provide, it is for God to provide. And if you keep his laws, you'll be amazed how he provides for you. Not only with the Sabbath year, but with many other things also. We just have too less confidence in the Lord providing for us. How do you guys see that? Oh, that's a really interesting point, Yerk. You know, my my mother, uh, if you don't mind, I'll make a quick comment here. Oh, my mother was a professional that worked at a, a company called Cray Research back in the late 80s and then into the 90s. And Cray Research was involved in super con computing, and they made the world's largest and fastest computers – And my mother taught how to use these computers uh, in uh, different uh, assembly languages, uh, computer languages. So she would teach, uh, you know, various locations uh, around the world, and she'd travel a lot. And uh, she worked there for many years. She worked hard and long hours. And, of course, you know, um, the pay scales were different for women than for men, of course. And um, so she actually uh, um, took care of our family. She, she did the labor for our family. And my dad, uh, he was working for the Star and Tribune. He lost his job. And, and when he lost, well, he, I'll tell you what, he was really frustrated with, uh, with the way they were working at the Star and Tribune because what they were doing is they were pitting one artist against another for jobs and it was driving him nuts because there was such tension in the in the workplace and it never used to be there before so talk about jesuitical tactics it was driving my dad nuts and he couldn't stand it anymore so he begged my mother to do some work so she said if you're going to have me work then i'm going to provide for the family the rest of my life and you can't stop me This is the story. If you ask her about it, she'll tell you about it. So then she started working, and there was something called a sabbatical that the workers would get at the end of their, uh, I forget how many, seven years, maybe, I don't know. Uh, however many years of service, they would get a sabbatical. So these bastards, excuse me, pardon me, but these bastards, these corporate jerks, fired her just before her sabbatical. And I'll never forget it. And I always thought, well, what? You know, you work for so many years for these people. You know, you work hard. You're going all over the place and doing everything they want you to do. And then they cut you off. I mean, isn't that corporate America? That's corporations for you around the world. They just, it's only about the bottom line, nothing else, you know. Get rid of the, the, the obligations that we have to, oh, you're going to get some big benefits? It's like the carrot and stick. Oh, yeah. Here, come on. Come on over here. Come on. Oh, that's gone. Bye. I, I was just thinking of the carrot and the stick. Thanks. I was, I was just going to make a comment on exactly that point. <laughs> They promise I mean, you things. Just, they, they promise you revolting. things, and they let you labor for them. And just before you reach them, they cut you off. That's exactly. And Brett, that is not yeah. only in America. <laughs> oh, no, that's no. that's over here that's in Europe worldwide. too. That's yep. worldwide. Absolutely. That's everywhere. It came from Europe. You know, most of our American heritage came from Europe. We don't give Europe enough credit, you guys. We don't. Americans are have their own. Uh, what can we say? Arrogance. You know, modern Americans are very arrogant. They are. They're jerks. 
but anyway, I, I'll stop my rant. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's it's interesting what you said there. I was just thinking about the parable of this uh, or the carrot on the stick. That's how you mm. get a donkey to ride for you, right? If he doesn't, do <laughs> exactly. <it. laughs> well, donkeys have a lot more uh, sense than some of these human beings do. Yeah, you can read that in the Old Testament by the ass of Be- uh, of, of uh, Be- Belial or what, what's his name, Be- Bilam. Bilam's, yeah, Bilam's right. ass, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, sometimes being an animal is better than being a human, I guess, or a man. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think so in some regard, that's true. Yeah. Anyway, um, it was interesting to read about this Sabbath year and to, to understand, of course, that uh, you know, sometimes we should go back to the quote-unquote Old Testament and see of these old rules because, you know, Even in this world, Brett, and with that I think we're going to close the subject down for the moment, the whole world is always speaking about the Sabbath and the Sabbath laws and the mark of the beast is Sunday and Saturday is the real rest or the moon Sabbath is the real rest or every day is Sabbath or I don't know, whatever they say. But whoever goes back to Leviticus and speaks about the sabbatical year, whoever goes back to Leviticus and speaks of the year of Jubilee, and when did we have the last year of Jubilee, according to our God on earth? Speaking of the Pope. Was that like 2015 or 16? Something like that. At the end of 2015, he opened the quote-unquote holy doors. Yeah. And the... And, and and the jubilee year and uh, for that jubilee year until the end of 2016 all these quote unquote holy doors were open uh, he, he explained it in that way that even a prisoner can have his sabbatical uh, jubilee year because every time he goes out of his cell that is when he goes through that holy door <laughs> that's not me making it up you can read that speech for yourself from Pope Francis I read it mm. Yeah, that's what mm. he said that, so mm. that even people who are in prison can enjoy that quote-unquote freedom of the sabbatical, of the jubilee year. Well, the jubilee year means that every debt is being taken away. Well, I tell you, I still have all my debt in my bank account. Nobody took that away in 2015 or 2016. Mm-hmm. Nobody were going to take it any uh, ever away, I guess. So mm. the problem is there is no sabbatical year. There is no jubilee year. And there is no Sabbath here that people know of. I mean, I keep the Sabbath on the Saturday because I think, and that's just my personal opinion, that God made the world in six days and then he invented the seventh day as a day of rest and this seventh day circle has never been broken since the day of creation. And that's why for me, Sabbath is the seventh day is the day of rest and Sunday is the first day of the week, a day that we should all work and... Um, that's my opinion, and I don't. Mm-hmm. Um, force, and I agree. I don't force that opinion on anybody else. Everybody has to know that for themselves. You know, I don't care anymore. I, I think there are more important things than to quarrel about the quote-unquote right Sabbath. I do the Sabbath. I I enjoy the Sabbath, and I keep the Sabbath the way the Holy Spirit leads me. If the spirit leads you in a different way, well, then you have to make that up with your spirit. I made it up with mine. Brett made it up with his, and I mm-hmm. think Michael made it up with his. And we all have the same agreement. That's quote unquote coincidence. <laughs> no, it's not coincidence, but that's just our understanding. Um, if you want to have a different understanding, no problem. But <clears throat> then tell me, what is your understanding of the sabbatical every seventh, seventh year, the Sabbath of the land? What is your understanding of the Jubilee after 49 years, seven sevenths, the 50th year, the year of Jubilee? What's your understanding of that? Where do you find this in the world? You only quarrel about the seventh day because you don't even care for the other Sabbaths. Right? I hear nobody ever talk about the Sabbaths that is mentioned here in Leviticus chapter uh, 25, verses 1 through 7. Never. The only Sabbath they quarrel about is the one day in the week. And that, by the way, to end this discussion, has biblically biblically never changed to another day. Never, ever. There is not one expression in the Bible that says, and now the Sabbath day uh, day is changed to the first day of the week. Yeah, Mark, I think you made our point. 
Yes. And it has described in the first chapter of Genesis. Yeah, that's what I said at the end of uh, yeah. of, of creation. Huh? Yeah. When, yeah. When, when six days of creation were done, God in. Uh, Imagine it must but must be he, the he, oldest the oldest law. Yeah, you see, he, he created. Of, yeah, he created the he created the Sabbath at the end of creation. Yeah. I think that is in uh, in the beginning of chapter two of Genesis, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, chapter 2, verse 2, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So, G Genesis chapter 2, verse 2 and 3 of the King James Authorized Version of 1611 tell you exactly who invented the Sabbath, why, when, how, and that same guy, just to speak blasphemically, never changed it. So why do you? Anyway, this is not a Sabbath question. It's just my point that when the author puts about here Leviticus 25, th uh, 1 through 7, I think that is very interesting to understand. And people should a little bit more read things like this to understand it. And also get a notion of this Sabbath, and not only the one that is always in discussion in the world here. So let's continue for a few moments. This is an institution, speaking of the sabbatical laws, of the sabbatical years and the jubilee years, this is an institution that stands alone in point of beneficence among human I don't like the word human here, but you can fill in mankind arrangements, man-made arrangements. How completely does it show that the rule of the great king is a rule of liberty? All these eras culminated in a great era of rest and liberty. That era bears a name melodious and sweet, like the silver trumpet whose peal ushered it in, the jubilee. Then the great trumpet was blown, and on the instant every fetter gave way. Every debt, bond, and obligation of whatever kind was cancelled. Every forfeited estate returned to its original owner. And throughout the whole land of Israel there was a universal restitution of all things, and this word universal does not mean Catholic. There was a universal restitution of all things as at the beginning of the era. We find the enactment concerning this high festival of freedom again in the book of Leviticus. Quote, And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall that fiftieth year be unto you. Ye shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy wine undressed. For it is the jubilee. It shall be holy unto you. Ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of the jubilee ye shall return every man unto his possession. Unquote. Again, Leviticus chapter 25 the following verses from 1 through 7, now 8 through 13. Now let us mark the gradation. Seven days made a Sabbath. Seven Sabbaths of years made a sabbatic year. And seven sabbatic years ushered in the Jubilee. These periods of sacred rest developed progressively and at last culminated in the grand jubilean period of emancipation and restitution. But the question forces itself upon the mind, 
did the Jubilee not look beyond itself? Had it not a typical character? Does it not stand here the glorious shadow of a far mightier and grander era of emancipation and restitution? If, as the Apostle informs us in the 10th chapter of Corinthians, so speaking about Paul, so many things in the history of Israel were types of blessings to be enjoyed under the Gospel, if this character belonged to the manna and the rock in the wilderness, so that they held forth and shadow spiritual privileges to be enjoyed in the age to come, how much more those great festivals which God appointed, which he so signally stamped with his own benefits, and whose stated return and solemn observance he so carefully regulated and enjoyed. Yes, the silver trumpet, which every fiftieth year sounded so glad appeal throughout the land of Israel, foretold a yet more blessed jubilee, and the believing Israelite, in the notes of the one, heard the first echoes of that trumpet which will sound the fall of idolatry all over the earth and the opening of the prison to the captives of every land. These festivals were types. They were as really types as the sacrifice, as the sacrifices. They were types specially appointed. They stood looking towards the future, and their faces caught a glory from that future towards which they looked. A day of liberty, so far off that no pagan poet had caught a glimpse of it, projected its first rays upon them. They were not that liberty but they saw its coming and foretold it. They were prophets of the millennium. Let us again glance back upon them and see what true prophets they were. As there were three periods of rest among the Jews, speaking of the Sabbath, the Sabbatic year and the Jubilee, which we just discussed very deeply, I think, in this book, so three periods of rest, or more properly, three servile periods ending in rest, stand predicted to pass over the church. The first, the captivity of 70 years. The second, the 70 years or 490 years, 70 weeks, sorry, or 490 years. And the third, the seven times, or 2520 years. Each of these be it also observed, like its Jewish type, is a servile period while it is running on, but, having completed its cycle, it passes instantly into a period of release. Be it remarked further that it is only the last period in each series that brings a full release. The Sabbath enfranchised the Israelite for only a day. With the close of the Sabbath and the return of the weekday, his burdens returned. The sabbatic year enfranchised the Israelite only while it lasted. His debts, obligations and toils returned with the following year. But the Jubilee brought a final release. All existing bonds and burdens it swept away. So, of the three great releases foretold in prophecy, the last only is the full and final one. The Seventy years brought a release from Babylon, but the church still remained under the world power. The seventy weeks brought Messiah the Prince and introduced the Gospel, but the brief respite was followed by a removal of bondage, renewal of bondage. But the seven times will witness the final breaking of all yokes and the full restoration of the church to the independence and supremacy she held while the theocracy existed. Nay, more glorious than ever will the church then appear. Quote, For thus, saith the Lord, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. And when ye see this, your heart shall rejoice, and your bones shall, flavor, shall flourish like an herb. Unquote. But Father, both the sabbatic year and the jubilee contain the root of that greater jubilean era 
which the quote-unquote seven times will usher in. In a sabbatic year were seven literal years, and in, a, and in seven literal years are 360 sabbaths, and in 360 sabbaths are 2,520 days. A sabbatic year was thus the seven times in miniature. Observe how it is with the Jubilee. This period ran on for 49 years in its character of servile, and then came the trumpet of release. In 49 years are seven sabbatic years, and in seven sabbatic years are 360 sabbaths multiplied by seven, or 2,520 sabbaths. Thus, again, did the Jubilee exhibit in type the great Jubilean period. In the sabbatic year were 2,520 days. In the Jubilee were 2,520 Sabbaths. And in the great New Testament Jubilee, or seven times, are 2,520 years. Days, Sabbaths, years were the three ascending grades by which the Israelite reached the highest festival of his church. Days, Sabbaths, years are the three ascending grades by which we mount to the august portals of the millennial church. Those gates, gates which are not to be shut at all by day, and there, and there shall be no night there. For now Satan is bound, and oppression is no more. It is farther observable that the last number of each series is obtained by multiplying the term of period into itself. Under the Old Testament, a Sabbath of Sabbaths, or seven sabbatic years, formed the Jubilee. In New Testament times, a Jubilee of Jubilees will give us the final Jubilee. In fifty Jubilees, there are within, <clears throat> in fifty Jubilees, there are within a few years of the appointed number of two thousand five hundred and twenty years. Thus we may say, as seven revolutions of the sabbatic year, seven being the sabbatic number, brought round the great sabbatic year or jubilee, so fifty revolutions to the jubilee of the jubilee, fifty being the jubilee number, will bring round the grand jubilee, the sabbath of the world. These statements... Sorry, I missed my line here. Uh, these statements may be accepted as approximations towards the full development of the principle of the prophetic cycles and the law of their progression. They tend to assure us, moreover, that the number 2520 is the number that rules the great bondage, and that its expiry will put an end alike to the suffering of the Church and to the glory of the world power. Whatever difficulty these periods may present, we may be sure that that difficulty now uh, no ways arises from anything indeterminate or inexact in the periods themselves. God has measured the periods of, the, of darkness and light in the natural world. And it cannot be that he has left uncertain the epochs of darkness and light in the moral universe. This is a matter that appertains to the righteousness of his government. Nay, it is a matter that appertains to its stability. These periods are part a parts of a great whole, and were they to exceed their appointed term, or were they to fall short of it, by even a hair's breadth, the plan of infinite of the infinite would be thrown into confusion. No, the cycles of time revolve with the same regularity as the cycles of the sky. The comet retreats into the far distant fields of space and for ages is buried in the darkness of the firmament, but it returns without fail from its journey of myriads of myriads of leagues and takes its place as the appointed moment among the stars of heaven, at the appointed moment among the stars of heaven. Is all determinate in nature, and is all indeterminate in providence? No. The same God who has ordained an order so admirable among the bodies of the sky, has ordained an order 
we may be sure, not less admirable among the events of his government. As move the stars of heaven, so move the acts of providence. God has fixed from all eternity the days the church shall pass in bondage, and the whole power of the kingdom of darkness shall not be able to postpone the decree of deliverance by a single instant. Quote, the offense taken by the chronological intimations of Daniel and the Apocalypse will vanish when they are seen from this point of view. Not only nature, but history is based in numbers. They are, so to say, the skeleton, the scaffolding of the organic edifice, says Oberlin. All things visible, so says Roos, are arranged by God wisely, according to times and numbers. He has applied most wisely arithmetic and geometry in the inanimate world. If so, that must his, uh, what must his government of rational creatures be? Surely pure righteousness, perfect order. Everything is necessarily measured out according to its essential value and dignity and the moral character of beings. Behold the divine mythesis. This is quoted in Oberlin's work on page 136 and brings an end to chapter 11 so that next time we can start anew with a fresh chapter, chapter 12, that is called A Vision of Cleansing or Second Chronological Line. But we have a little moment over to discuss especially this last remarks of the author here, or better said of, uh, of Roos, um, which is here quoted by Oberlin that I found quite interesting, where he says, um, the offense taken at the chronological intimations of Daniel and the Apocalypse will vanish when they are seen from this point of view. Not only nature, but history, especially the history that we know of, when we know real, true history, and that is why history is forgerized all over the world, and the Jesuits busy themselves with us not knowing true history, is based in numbers. They are, so to say, the skeleton, the scaffolding of the organic edifice. All things visible are arranged by God wisely, according to times and numbers. He has applied most wisely arithmetic and geometry in the inanimate, uh, inanimate world. Now, the point that I have with this uh, is that I always was very bad in mathematics, arithmetics. And I don't know if I ever will be good in that anyway. But I tell you that what we experience in this world of arithmetics or mathematics very often is a deception because the point where it starts off is wrong and when the point when you are going to do any kind of equation or any kind of numbering in arithmetics when the point where you start from is wrong the whole line of computing that follows is wrong also. I guess you guys agree with me, right? Yeah. And, like this, a, um, and this, um, is, this is why you have people like Einstein who come up mm. with a quote-unquote theory of relativity and that is debunked in these days and it is wrong because the the, the the point where he where he where we started from was wrong already. Foundation. The foundation, yeah, thanks. The foundation was wrong. Yeah? And that's the point with arithmetics and with mathematics and with science in this world. Very often times the foundation is wrong, and because the foundation is wrong, then all the computing is wrong and the results they show you is wrong. And you want to know a good example of that? Global warming for example. They throw in wrong numbers, they start with the wrong foundation, they start first and for all with the foundation of man-made climate change. They put man in such a high position that all the computing is wrong and of course therefore the results are wrong in the end. But God has applied most widely arithmetic and geometry in an inanimate world. So that means when we follow the true arithmetic of God, 
all the computing all of a sudden will make sense. And we will come to completely different results when we use the arithmetic and geometry that our Father in Heaven applied. We will come to completely different results as we come in this world, which is of the Antichrist, who you know by now turns everything the Bible says 180 degrees around, gives you wrong foundations, and when you start from that foundation, you come, of course, to a wrong conclusion or wrong solution. And the problem is, the whole world doesn't care, and they just run after the masses, and so they are deceived by masses. And that concludes my participation of the reading of today. And I want to leave some closing remarks, of course, and a little discussion with my brothers Michael and Brett. Come on, guys. It's over you. Yeah, thank you for the reading, Jörg. I just realized how much deception there is in these days because you see that uh, we do not hold any biblical numbers valid in these days so it's it's not only for the sabbath but also for the jubilee and uh, i cannot help it but it's so uh, it's, it's so completely erased the teachings of the bible that i think that people would be blame you that you are a liar or, or, or do deceptions because they cannot comprehend the level of deception which is been made uh, public by the Roman Catholic Church the last 2,000 years or almost, or 1,800 years, whatsoever. But I think that's, that's a, it's a, it's a so deep, this impact is so deep that uh, the people cannot, cannot really imagine the deception is too much to handle for them. And that's, this, is, this is the impression I got from this lecture today, that it does not depend how much lecture we put out on the internet, uh, people cannot handle it because the deception is simply too big. It's too big and it's, it's so in, their, in the tradition that the people cannot ask for themselves, cannot think for themselves because they cannot even imagine how far, uh, far this has gone up to now. I think it's, it's far m more than man can handle. And that's the impression I got from this lecture today. I agree with wow. you. Yeah. Wow. Wow. You guys, this comes full circle. I mean, this is like... This is an epiphany moment on the Brett Norman broadcast channel on YouTube and maybe BitChute, too. You know, this kind of sums up the whole thing, doesn't it? I mean, let's turn a blind eye to Israel, especially the Israel that came out of Egypt, and let's just erase all of their history and... Let's just erase all of their heritage and let's just erase all of the Puritans that came over, you know, and in, into the so-called Puritans. You know, this is the Antichrist. He puts these terms on us like Puritan or heretic or whatever you want to call it. You know, we're a little different than you. You know, why is it that people don't appreciate their friends? Friends have differences. They're not all the same. We have to appreciate those differences. They're blessings in disguise, are they not? That's the way I see it. I don't look at my friends as my enemies unless they come after me for my Bible. Then I look at them as an enemy. Is there something wrong with that? I don't think so. You know, there's a lot of problems in this world. And if we don't define where they come from, we're in a little bit of trouble. You know, you can't just trust everybody, can you now? Because if you do, you end up believing everybody. <laughs> and, you know, Yerk and I have been in a Bible study with Tom now for a few weeks, more than a few weeks. And every time we come back to this small phrase in the Bible... Beloved, believe not every spirit. 
we really cannot trust people that come from different backgrounds all the time. We have to be corrected. We must stand on some authority that is infallible. So we have to define what infallible is. And look at what the Roman world has done. Defined a man as infallible? Hello? Something wrong with this picture here? How about the old paths? Like it says in the book of Jeremiah, that's my foundation for my faith. I don't know about you guys, but... I just love it that you put out our study that we are doing already, I think, oh. tonight, probably for the fifth week in um, uh, in um, succession. First uh, John chapter 4. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are yeah, of God. Try the spirits. Who's trying the spirits? Hello, world. Hello, world. YouTube. Anyone out there? I don't care. Have, have you tried the spirits lately? Wake up! Try the really spirits. Really ticked. Try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets or false friends, as Brett puts it here, are yeah. gone out into the world. I wrote it down on a note. It says, "How about the Bible? The Bible alone. How about it?" Let's get to it. Like in the book of Acts, brother, the one that I mentioned yes. so many times, uh, the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 11. Uh, let's just go there. I have to open my, my King James Bible here. Um, Acts eleven seventeen. it says, For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, no, sorry, that's... Uh, that's 1117. I mean 1711. I'm sorry. <laughs> Wrong page. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, all right. Uh, that, that's here. Uh, and the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night to Berea, who, coming thither, went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. And this in accordance with First John chapter 4. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of an antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Measure everything against the Bible, and anything that cannot stand against the light of the Bible is false, is a lie, and is of the antichrist. I think that's the point that Brett wanted to make with his own words. And I'm just adding a few words of the Bible, and there we go again. And we have a f real study of like <laughs> we do in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Oh, I feel like we could go for another hour right now on this, Yerk. Yeah, but I don't have the time. I'm just teasing. <laughs> I'm just teasing. But uh, look, I looked up Hebrews. We did a study in Hebrews. Man, Hebrews just packs it home for me as far as the, the, the rest is concerned. You know, entering into the rest of the Lord, entering into the Sabbath. Chapter 10 or you chapter know. 11, is that right? Well, I'm starting in chapter 3 here. Oh, okay. Wherefore, okay, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, to the day, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. 
take heed, brethren, lest there be any in any in any, excuse me, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, for we are all partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, today, if we, excuse me, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But anyway, we could go on and on and on and on, but it's so fundamental. And our church has deceived us so badly and so greatly. I'm very concerned, very, very concerned, and I hope you are too, listener. These days we're living in are so troubling, so difficult, so hard to even hold a conversation about the Bible anymore without really ticking someone off and making them angry with you for the rest of their life. Troubling times we live in, especially for those that claim to find Christ. Very troubling times. And with that, we'll close the session. Looking forward to the great exodus or the time of the end next time with both you, Yerk, and Michael. Thank you very much. We'll see you then. God bless and bye-bye. What made uh, one think that the uh, lodge was uh, a Christian place was the fact that I found people who were uh, members of the same church uh, to uh, which I belong, the Presbyterian Church in Canada, were members of the lodge, uh, members in prominent positions in the lodge. And the fact that these members uh, in their rituals used uh, quotations from scripture uh, sort of doubly made one think that it was okay. Speaking to the head potentate of the shrine in Minneapolis, where I'm from, he called me up one day and he had heard my tape on masonry. He says, how dare you say that masonry is not Christian? He says, I'm a deacon in my church. I teach Sunday school in my church. He says, I'm a good Christian. He says, and I'm the head of the shrine. How can you say I'm not a Christian? Masons uh, love to infiltrate organizations. I mean, they've infiltrated uh, the major uh, uh, religions in this country to where uh, well, we went to a, a church in Upperville, Virginia for a while and uh, after the uh, pastor learned that I was doing this book uh, he came out and said, yeah, you know, I was a Mason and I came out, I started speaking out against it from the pulpit and uh, my career plummeted from that point uh, so he was at this little backwater Baptist church in Upperville and uh, he said that 90% of uh, the Southern Baptist hierarchy are Masons and that if you wish to excel uh, in the Southern Baptist ministry, you have to be a Mason. He said the same was true of, I believe, both Lutherans and Methodists, that he estimated that it was 90% uh, Masonically infiltrated at that point. Now that's, that's the key point of the conspiracy, because if any of you have made bread, how much leaven, which is just yeast, does it take to make bread? Not very much, just a little bit. I mean, if you put too much in, you're going to have something that looks like the monster that devoured Cleveland sitting there on your countertop. Uh, you just take a little bit, and then you work the dough, and you work the dough, and what happens? The leaven disappears. It just sort of blends into the dough, and you can't even tell where it went. But it starts percolating through the entire mass of dough, until all of a sudden, you've got the whole thing leavened. And that's how this works in the church. That's how the conspiracy works in society in general. If you've got one Mason in your congregation, and especially if he's like a deacon or somewhere else in leadership, you're going to end up with um, a kind of one bad apple spoiling the whole barrel routine. That's percolating down, and you're going to have all sorts of issues within your, within your local body. Similarly, if you have a Mason in your family, 
His spiritual authority is going to percolate down and leaven the lives of, your, of the wife, of the children, of the grandchildren, of the great-grandchildren, down three or four generations, and that's a curse that needs to be broken. Leaven, like yeast, is a living organism which is capable of reproducing itself, and that's what happens. You never just have one of these dudes in a church. They always start recruiting, because Masons are like homosexuals. They can't reproduce themselves naturally. They can only, yeah, amen, they can only recruit. You know, think of that. That's the way with every cult. See, we are born again. At times, our efforts and works seem to fail and not produce fruit. We need to remember that we are followers of Jesus Christ and his life, humanly speaking, ended in failure, the failure of the cross. This means that we must be especially attentive to every type of fundamentalism, whether religious or of any other kind. A delicate balance is required to combat violence perpetrated in the name of a religion, an ideology, or an economic system. There is another temptation which we must especially guard against. The simplistic reductionism which sees only good or evil, or if you will, the righteous and sinners.